Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this important live stream. This live hearing in Congress is happening uh, this morning on the SBA 7A funding program. So the SBA 7A, they're expanding access to the program. Um, I, we're going to listen into a lot of this, but I want to give a quick recap. So, you know, post EIDL, there's a ton of interest in additional funding options. Let's let's have a listen in to the, uh, the speaker here. And um, I'm going to give commentary throughout the video when my dog's not barking here. Thank you for being here today, sir. And I recognize myself for my opening statement. I want to welcome everybody here today, today's hearing, which will focus on the much needed oversight of the Small Business Administration and their proposed changes to the 7A loan program. The SBA administers several programs to support small business that encourage lenders to provide loans to Main Street who might not otherwise be able to obtain financing. Their flagship 7A loan program offers government guaranteed loans to eligible small businesses for short and long-term capital needs. The SBA is in the process of finalizing two rules that will represent the most significant changes to the program in decades. Well, there are many more, many more troubling aspects of these rules. The most problematic, in my opinion, are the changes to the underwriting standards, which simultaneously allowing more fintech companies to become 7A lenders. The SBA is throwing away the nine perspective elements of underwriting that lenders have been using for decades to determine if a borrower is eligible for a government-backed loan. Instead, lenders will now be able to use whatever lending criteria they see fit, considering that taxpayers will go and be the ones on the hook if a significant portion of those loans go bad. We should not be loosening the criteria for lenders to give loans. Additionally, these rules reverse the moratorium on licensing new small business lending companies, better known as SBA LCs. The moratorium was initially put in place in the 1980s because the SBA recognized that they were not capable of being the primary federal regulator of these entities. Given the unacceptable levels of fraud that occurred in the SBA's pandemic programs, I have serious concerns that the agency is not up to the task of tacking on more responsibility. I'm not alone in raising these concerns about the SBA's capabilities. Last month, when the SBA's Inspector General testified before this committee, he noted the significant challenges that the agency will face in managing the increased loan volume going forward, as well as the significant shortages of staff within the department charged with overseeing SBLCs. There are serious concerns that these changes to the program will be detrimental to taxpayers and small businesses alike. If more loans start to default, the fees to the program are going to have to be raised or the agency will come to Congress to ask for more taxpayer dollars to make up for the shortcomings. The policy notice released last night, late last night, which lays out implementation for just one of the final rules is not sufficient and does not satisfy our concerns. This is an extremely important hearing as we in Congress discuss what the future of this program will look like and what we must do legislatively to ensure the programmatic. And I'm going to share my thoughts in a minute. Here. 7A program in the future. We've got the opening. I want to thank you all again for being right here with here. us today, and I'm looking forward to today's and conversation. And with that, I yield to our distinguished ranking member from New York, Ms. Velasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding for holding this important hearing. And just to interject before we hear Ms. Velasquez, this is a big deal for the 7A program. So this is why we're going live. It's kind of breaking news. Um, and there's a few links in the description on 7A, about 7A, and the rule changes proposed so far, which basically will increase access, allow more lenders to give out more 7A. So if you are applying for 7A, the likelihood of you being approved for one in theory would increase. Let's listen in a bit more. Totaling more than $14.6 billion, providing just how integral, proving just how integral the 7A program is to our nation's entrepreneurial ecosystem. 7A loans strengthen local communities, create jobs, and move our economy forward. Given the critical nature of the 7A program, this committee must carefully consider and vet any significant changes. Last month, SBA issued two final rulemakings that have substantial implications for the 7A program. The affiliation rule loosens lending criteria 
update loan conditions and eliminate various affiliation standards. While the second rule on SBLCs ends the SBA's long-standing moratorium on licensing new SBLCs. In the final rule, SBA states that it can license and supervise <laughs> three new SBLCs. And it is speculated that some, if not all, of these new licenses will be granted to fintech companies. SBA instituted these rules to address persistent gaps in access to capital as part of the Biden administration's broader economic agenda. Increasing access to capital for underserved entrepreneurs has been and will remain a priority for me as the top Democrat on this committee. However, I am apprehensive about the SBA's decision to remove many of the long-standing guardrails and program requirements on loan criteria and affiliation standards that have served the 7A program well while also lifting its moratorium on the licensing of new SBLCs. I am especially concerned by the possibility of new SBLC licenses being granted to non-federally regulated fintechs with no experience in 7A program lending. Researchers have highlighted that fintechs facilitated most of the significant fraud associated with the Paycheck Protection Program. I appreciate SBA taking this situation seriously and the steps the agency has taken thus far to hold the blatant actors responsible for their actions. With and I, I did a long video on that, uh, on the fraud from fintech companies. So it may be a valid concern. Visualize a highly successful program that has helped millions of entrepreneurs. The last thing we want is for unintended consequences of sweeping changes by rulemaking without detail accompanying SOPs to harm the future of this. So basically what's happening in this hearing is there's some criticism over these two rule changes. Just to summarize what we've heard from her so far is um, she, you know, because of the Wompleys, uh, all, all those fintech companies that perpetuated a lot of the PPP fraud, there's fear that by allowing those types of fintech companies to start to give out 7A loans, they're going to make it even easier. So people maybe with lower credit standards, things like that, will be able to be approved, you know, similar to how EIDL PPP was facilitated. So that's some of the fear and the criticism here, even though these rules are basically about to be approved. And do not negatively impact the 17 program and individual borrowers. Ensuring that businesses owned by women, people of color, and underserved groups is an important goal that I share with the Administrator Guzman. Today, I look forward to hearing from Mr. Kelly and the steps SBA is taking to ensure these rules do not risk the integrity of the 7A program. I remain committed. To so we're still in the opening statements and basically Patrick Kelly, who's the head of the Office of Capital Access at the SBA, is testifying. So they're going to pepper him with questions. Uh, I think these rules are still going to go through. This is more a formality, but we'll see. There may be some surprises here. But I just wanted to also, I can't share the screen over the live video here, but traditionally there's been, let's say, 10 7A lenders who've done the vast majority of 7A lending. So the reason for these rule changes was, well, what if you can't get approved from one of these 10 banks? It's a very small number. If they increase who can give out 7A loans, they'll increase the number of entrepreneurs and small businesses who can receive SBA 7A funding. So let's hear from Patrick Kelly, who's this administration. Here. At the SBA, Mr. Kelly leads the agency's Office of Capital Access and has been leading the charge for the rules change we speak of. Mr. Kelly is a graduate of Colgate University and Boston College Law School. In a previous stint at the SBA, Mr. Kelly served as Deputy Chief of Staff, Deputy Association Administrator, and Senior Advisor at the agency, and also worked at the U.S. Department of Commerce. In between his time at the SBA, Mr. Kelly served as the Executive Vice President for Channel Partnerships at Live Oak Bank, where he primarily worked for the bank's corporate strategy and development team. 
Mr. Kelly, I want to thank you for joining the committee today. And Live Oak is the largest SBA 7A lender. Speaking of that, last year they approved $1 billion in SBA 7A lendings. So he knows the program well. Uh, Chairman uh, Williams, uh, ranking member of Alaska, as members of the committee, uh, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of President Biden, Vice President Harris, and Administrator Guzman. Um, as Chairman Will Williams um, noted, um, I have been the Associate Administrator for the Office of Capital Access since March 1st and of 2021. The SBA uh, during that time, members. I've been responsible for uh, the CARES Act uh, programs, as well as the uh, Restaurant Revitalization Program, which was a part of the American Rescue Plan. Um, and then uh, also uh, in July of 2021, uh, took over responsibility for originations for the disaster loan programs. Historically, the Office of Capital Access has always overseen the post-close servicing of those assets. Um, with respect to the core programs uh, that have been highlighted by the ranking member's statement, as well as the chairman's statement, uh, I over also oversee the 7A loan program. Uh, the 504 program, the SBA microloan program, and the surety bond program. Um, since March 1st, 2021, um, under Biden-Harris and when Administrator Guzman came on board at the latter part of March, we have focused um, like a laser on the outstanding issues that we inherited with respect to fraud, waste, and abuse associated with the Paycheck Protection Program, as well as the COVID idle program. Uh, during the two-year period um, that I've overseen these programs. We have reviewed close to 42 million, uh, 41.9 million uh, applications across those programs. We have uh, approved across those programs 21 million applications for close to $1.2 trillion. Uh, we have identified 6.7 million suspicious loans. We've done that through automatic screenings as well as data analytics or supervised learning uh, tools that the GAO and the Inspector General have highlighted our best practice with respect to identifying suspicious activity. There have been close to 3.8 million human-led reviews, which have resulted in referrals to the Office of the Inspector General. And we estimate that a million loans uh, that were dispersed uh, across uh, those the PPP program and the COVID idle program uh, represent $41 billion of total fraud on dispersed. The estimated number of fraud prevented um, is north of $100 billion. And there was $500 billion that was never allowed to be moved forward as an application through the automated screening. Uh, in the coming days, uh, the Administrator Guzman will be releasing um, a white paper report detailing all of this, as well as the detailed steps, the automated screening, the uh, supervised learning model that we deployed, as well as the human-led reviews and the referrals to the office. Forty-one of billion General. dollars. President Biden's in uh, budget from lays out a request uh, for a hundred million dollars for the office of the Inspector General. That's nuts, by the way. The scope of the fraud, even though they're claiming they've saved a hundred billion, but when the report is released later this week, I'll, we'll share those details as well. Open case files. Uh, but certainly the numbers that we have referred, um, that the SBA has referred to the Office of the Inspector General, the so-called bad guys that we believe they should go after need resources. Uh, with respect to the lessons learned from this and how we will handle the issues and concerns that were highlighted by uh, Chairman Williams and Ranking Member Velasquez's opening remarks, uh, we will be moving forward as we did for phase three of the Paycheck Protection Program and as we did for the Restaurant Revitalization Program with a regulatory compliance and fraud framework pre ETRAN authorization. Um, and that process will um, uh, uh, validate not only uh, uh, know your customer or fraud issues like OFAC and other issues, but it will also identify uh, alerts and flags with respect to eligibility. The core of eligibility is a for profit company domiciled in the US, uh, an operating company. Uh, considered small by SBA size requirements with no character issues and legal uh, resident status. All of those uh, indicators were vetted uh, in the restaurant revitalization program. Um, and it's important to understand that we did not need to make the trade off in 2020 between speed and certainty. We were able to uh, stand up a program uh, in 30 days post passage, disperse $28.6 billion to 101,000 101, restaurant and related entities, 
And we were able to do that uh, with uh, uh, certainty that there would not be fraud or ineligible. Uh, uh, He's folks. basically so blaming forward to taking questions the previous administration the opportunity to address uh, any concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we will now move to the member questions under the five minute. A lot of numbers there. They're going to answer, uh, ask him questions now. We'll listen to a few of these. But um, basically, they're saying that the RRF under this administration was done really well. There was little fraud and saying it's possible to prevent fraud. They're going to expand. They have 10 years, by the way, to go back and investigate all of the PPP and RRF and EIDL. So they have 10 years to go back and investigate and potentially, um, you know, uh, penalize or indict rather people who uh, than what you told your staff or our staffs regarding the need to bring more lenders into the program. So my first question, uh, Mr. Kelly, is so who isn't being truthful, the SBA or the White House? Um, neither is not being truthful. Uh, what we have stated is that over a five year period, there is a 40 percent or 50 percent decline in the number of loans and dollars lent under 150,000. So what we're reporting in those numbers is a year over year increase. So since the Biden Harris administration took over and as chairman uh, ranking member of Velasquez referenced, prioritized making small dollar loans an issue, we've seen improvements in year over year. There's still a stark decline in the access of capital uh, for the loans under 150,000. So the SBA's Office of Inspector General has found that many non-depository lenders in the 7A program were subject to limited oversight until a default occurs and identified significant issues within the agency relating to lender oversight. The Inspector General also noted a failure of the SBA to conduct regularly scheduled examinations over high-risk lenders. In short, the OIG has reported on many issues that questions the agency's ability to be a regulator, and I share these serious same concerns. And last night, the SBA released the policy notice for just one of the final rules to lenders that will help implement these new rules. It appears that for loans under $500,000, the agency removed almost all underwriting criteria and lenders are allowed to give out loans however they see fit to anybody. And carving out smaller loans from any standard underwriting requirement is one of the worst ways to mitigate risk and will increase the chances of predatory lending on small business and taxpayers. So, the agency is bringing on more lenders and diminishing underwriting standards at a time when the agency is already failing to conduct all the necessary oversight over the risk lenders. You don't need to be bigger. You need to be smaller. And this is a recipe for disaster. So, Mr. Kelly, what percentage of the current loan portfolio is under $500,000? And how will the SBA monitor the many different Loaded underwriting question. models that will be used by the lenders since you took away the uniform standard? So uh, two things. First, the reports you reference from the Office of the Inspector General reference uh, high risk lenders based on a quarterly uh, rank order that the agency and the Office of Credit Risk Management does to all of its assets. We rank each outstanding loan as high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And then based on the percentage of a lender's portfolio, we schedule supervised uh, oversight as a result. That report does not single out a type of lender. It speaks to all lenders and the overwhelming majority of lenders that the uh, IG has reviewed in its sample set um, are in fact regulated entities, banks and credit unions. That's number one. Number two, with respect to the underwriting standards since 2004. It's really interesting here. You know, um, the chairman's claim is that they're giving out half million dollar loans willy nilly and uh, Mr. Kelly's going through the criteria of how the SBA actually analyzes lenders. And so uh, certainly I, I think they have a good methodology. I've seen them issue reports. I've read the reports. I've seen them make changes over the past three years. Uh, there's still fraud, though. Policy has outperformed in terms of default rate and loss rate. So what I would say to Chairman Williams, and I think we can all agree, is that letting the marketplace lenders uh, with uh, and removing red tape has demonstrated in that program, which was originally a pilot program that a Republican administration started. In addition, a Republican administration expanded that exact same criteria to Patriot Express for veteran owned loans and Community Express to attack the very same problem that Seems was identified under Bush, which is the dearth of small dollar loans going to sole proprietors. The rough order of magnitude of loans under uh, 50,000 in terms of units is uh, somewhere between 40 to 45% annually, and 60% of those units have been originated in the SBA Express program 
because that standard allows the lenders to follow their credit and collateral policies and it has performed better. Almost half of all loans under $50,000. Yeah, his mic is not on. So we're not hearing him. But um, until they get that fixed. But basically, Patrick Kelly's saying there's they've mitigated risk. They've mitigated fraud. They rank everyone who comes in as high, medium, low risk. And um, that's not changing. I think the only ma major change, and by the way, we'd love to hear what you think about this, uh, because he's addressing a lot of things when it comes to uh all of the SBA programs, but love to hear what you think about all this. Moratorium for 40 years. Those SBL licenses could always be purchased by any type of lender. And in fact, 61 times were purchased and approved. And there has not been an issue with the committee in that uh, 40 years regarding those 61 transfers. With respect to the oversight time of up. those entities, it is exactly the same across all entity types. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, uh, for being here today. Uh, the rules are set to go into effect uh, within the next week, correct? That's correct. One week. Yet the SBA didn't release any information about the implementation of either of these two rules until late last night. Uh, and SOPs still haven't been published. Can you explain why the SBA has waited so long to release any guidance when it knew the rules were going into effect this week. Yes, so as been noted by uh, Ranking Member Velasquez and Chairman Williams, I've uh, participated in the Obama administration. Uh, I also, as Chairman Williams noted, uh, participated for a large SBA lender for six years in the private sector. There is okay. nothing about the implementation with respect to the posting of procedural notices that precede uh, SOP publication post rules becoming final. We are in the third, as you know, we are in the 30 day window before the rules become final. We wanted to get the procedural notice out. So some very technical procedural stuff, but um, my takeaway is they're trying to pepper him with hard questions. They're, these rules are gonna happen anyway. So it's it's their job to you know, play bad cop is, is essentially what they're doing. I think it will be published if not today, this week. Because when you went to the Senate, you stated that it will be released. Just want to say, I said at the top too, but first of all, thanks everyone for watching this important testimony today. This is in Congress, Patrick Kelly, head of the Office of Capital Access. So basically he's the number two in the SBA, Isabel Guzman, the administrator, then him. He runs all the S the 7A lending programs, EIDL. Uh, maybe he's telling a joke. There. Uh, so uh, um... We missed the joke. But um for anyone who's looking for SBA funding, I think these rule changes will really help. That's the goal of these policy changes, to allow more of you watching as small business owners, more of you to get approved for SBA 7A funding. And one of the rule changes I just want to mention is basically making it so any bank who wants to give you a loan, they'll be able to use the same standards that they use for non-SBA loans for SBA loans, just to make it easier. So like whether it's SBA or whether it's a private loan, it's the same process. Well, it makes it, it, makes it necessary in terms of, there's an order uh, of the way that um, APA and um, our- uh, And if you wanna track 7A, a lot of you I think are applying for 7A or you're looking at microloans, microloans under $50,000, SBA 7A loans go up to $5 million, typically, Terms can be up to 10 years, um, not like 30-year EIDL loans, but still good terms, good interest rates. Um, there's a link in the description for more details to track it. And of course, when these final rules are announced, uh, I'll do a shorter video that kind of walks you through what you need to know and, and how it affects you. So I'll probably do that later in Banks the week. And credit unions in my 13 years of being exposed to this have asked for repeatedly uh, and routinely over every year. Um, so Okay. Uh, so the, the final rule changed the definition of an SBLC from what was proposed in the, in, in the rule. Uh, the proposed rule stated that an L SBLC was quote, only to make loans pursuant to the 7A and microloan program. 
But in the final rule, SBA deleted the word only. By removing the word only was the intent to allow SBLCs to begin making non-SBA loans? Well, um, today, any, all, all of our lenders make non-SBA loans. We, we are responsible for overseeing the loans that they make within our program. And, and as the IG has highlighted in its, its management uh, challenges report, the key areas that we're responsible for oversight are eligibility and reasonable reassurance of repayment. Uh -huh. And so um, we, we, we are responsible for overseeing that. I can't speak to the exact clause that you're talking about, but, but the intent has always been an SBLC. Right here, have have it right been. here. Small business lending companies. If, you know, it is a non-depository lending institution that is SBA sure. licensed and is authorized by SBA 2 and what was proposed in the proposed rule in the draft only to make loans pursuant to section. The word only was deleted. My question to you is, mm -hmm. if SBLCs were to begin issuing both SBA back loans and non-SBA loans, are you concerned that these lenders will prioritize their private issuances over their SBA portfolio? defeating our goal to right. increase access sure. to capital for the smaller loans. Yes. So uh, one of the, one of the, and, and feel free to uh, in, engage with lenders on this point. But one of the things that happens today mm -hmm. is non uh, bank lenders or competitors make uh, loans that are subordinate to uh, senior debt or SBA loans today. So it is the case today uh, that small business owners seeking working capital um, seek out additional capital if they can get it. With respect to the issue that you're speaking to, we dealt with this issue, for example, in the Community Advantage program, where a Community Advantage lender, a CDFI, was originating loans um, on an interim basis and then refining them into the Community Advantage loan program. What I don't understand is why do you make the deletion? Why do you delete only? Yes, I'm happy to follow up with your okay. staff because uh, at, I, while I my time my lawyer, has expired. Uh, I, I have to take a look at the actual citations that you're citing. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I now, I now recognize. So it was a good question. We're going to get a, a couple more in here, but basically, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, her, I think her her question was around um, if a lender has the option of giving out a private loan or an SBA loan. If someone comes in for an SBA, is my understanding that um, maybe the lender would say, "Well, let's not go after the SBA loan, but why don't you you get our own private loan?" And in, in theory, they'll get more on that. Um, you know, they can make more on that rather. So I think that was her line of questioning. I'm not sure Patrick Kelly uh, fully understood, or he didn't have a good answer there. And tell you, we've asked that question multiple times of her and his committee, and we never get an answer from us. That may be the first time she's ever met with him, as far as we know. Publicly attended event in the uh the rose garden for was it about national was small about small business, business issues it was for national small business week yes and it was okay. celebrating uh the nation well i hope she talked week. about some of his programs and how they're she did negatively negatively affecting the, the small business community because that to me is what needs to be done mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay mr kelly what um how many people are in the at the sba uh this i think in the office here in, in, in dc uh, in the office here in DC, I'm, I'm not sure what the total the total headcount for the agency is. I think something around 2,000 plus, and then it uh, goes up and down. How many people are in your departments? Put that way. These questions are funny. It's like they're all trying to be interrogators, um, basically, and put him on the spot and try to make him uncomfortable. Maybe they're doing a good job. Today. All of them. In in this building, in in your SBA building, how many of them show up today? Uh, I don't have a head count of who showed up physically today. As you know, are they all sure required what? to show up to work every day? Yes, I'm not talking about off 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 campus being uh, qualified work. I'm talking about physically being in your they they are office. they are complying with what they've been asked to do. <clears> that's not what I ask. I'm sorry, that's not I what I asked. That, I asked how I'm a question, the question of whether actually showing up in the office yes. that you work in every day. I understand your question. And civil servants are complying with what they're asked to do. No, that's they not, serve not, on behalf of the public, and they haven't. They haven't. They are responsible to comply. Okay, so they're not with showing what they're up at to. your office, is what you're saying. 
because they, they are they are doing they are they are doing their job oh. as they were required by their position descriptions and as their supervisors. Okay, so you're 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 you're, you're 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 telling me that they're not. Which well, it's no that, that goes to any the, of the point. private sector entities that are. Doing I'm not exactly talking about private sector, thing. Mr. Mr. K. I'm talking about your office mm -hmm. that you you're in charge of. Just getting the people priced. are not showing up Patrick personally to, to set a desk in their their your office building not. to do their work. Mm -hmm. You're allowing them to do it from home, which that's fine if you want to do that. But the next question is, whenever you have, um, Man. Uh, well, in, in 2019, the inspector general claimed that the Office of Credit Risk Management failed to perform effective oversight over the OCRM, only conducted 108 of its planned 358 reviews of high-risk lenders. COVID-19 only exacerbated this issue as oversight staffing levels decreased by an additional 38%. Despite this, the SBA has lifted the SBLC moratorium, allowing for more non-depository entities who are purely regulated by SBA rather than federal regulators to enter the market. So it goes to the point that you know, you're, 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 the, oh, the, the inspector general said you need more oversight and you have less people to do it and they're not even at their office to do it themselves. This is a problem. It is a big problem. So, you know, I guess the rationale is, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you expect to get anything done whenever you don't have anybody in the office? Well, judging by the fact that the agency supported $1.2 trillion of uh, lending and grant activity over a two-year period <clears> where <throat> the entire agency was teleworking, I think we've demonstrated that we will do our job. Well, thanks to the banks and credit unions that were able to put that all out, uh, which goes back to the point I was wanting to make here a little bit ago. You talked about... Um, I think one point also because each questioner has five minutes, they typically don't listen to the reply. They just want to talk on their soapbox for five minutes. And uh, as you can see, that's what he's doing now. not letting Mr. Kelly reply. PPP. It's roughly, uh, 45, 55, uh, PPP <coughs> to COVID idle. So for $46 billion, we paid the lenders to, okay. So the idle program was roughly thousand instances of fraud. Idle program was roughly 400. Uh, billion and they had about 20 billion worth of fraud and the PPP program was about 800 billion and they had about less than 20 billion. Or we paid the lenders $46 billion in servicing fees for a 4% fraud rate. So it, it goes to the point though that the PPP program was highly successful and most of the fraud according to the IG report was in the it was in the fintech folks. That's not what the IG report. That's the, Mr. Ware was in, sitting in that seat not, did a, not, say not, that. not a month ago and that's did not what he say said. That. So it's hard for me to, for you to dispute that, sir. It is easy um, to dispute so that. The problem, the the problem is that you're trying to make up your own set of facts, which not. are not uh, verified by the Inspector General report. So um, again, whenever you go back to, to the compliance of KYC, BSA, how do you under how do you get the fintech companies to be able to comply with that? Because this is where the problem is. This is where, mm -hmm. and, and now you're expanding to the fintech companies. Uh, it really begs the question of do you, do you know what the hell you're doing? Because you're you're it, it's it's putting the fox in charge of the hen house again. You're allowing the very people who are the problem children to be involved in the program and continue to do things without any oversight. This is crazy. It's not. And as I mentioned in my opening statement, um, and as we demonstrated in the restaurant revitalization program, as well as phase three of PPP, we have and will place in front of <coughs> ETRAN authorization our fraud. Were those, were, those, were those sort of oversight principles in place during the PPP program? Yes. And they were not followed, uh, adhered they to. Were not this is why the fraud the was. They were not in place during 2020 under the Trump administration. They Next were in step. place under the Biden-Harris administration. Time's yes. expired. So we put fraud control. Your in place. time has expired. Mm -hmm. uh, I now recognize Ms. Mr. McGarvey from Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kelly, thank you for being here today and for providing insight in the SBA's intentions with these proposed rules. I know a lot of small businesses wouldn't be where they are today without the SBA's support, uh, including from the 7A program. It's, it's critical that we have 7A remain an effective program so that small businesses have this, particularly minority-owned businesses, businesses that would struggle without access to capital. Under the affiliation rule, the SBA is eliminating standardized underwriting requirements for loan issuance and replacing them with a system that considers lending criteria like a borrower's credit score and history and their business's earnings and cash flow. Under the policy noted. So just to follow up on the last line of questioning, which was the most contentious we've seen, uh, he was basically saying the SBA doesn't know what they're doing. And the only success, the only reason PPP was successful, it, it had less fraud, is because private lenders 
uh, were able to distribute a lot of that funding. Of course, he, it's kind of contradictory because he's also the rule changes about expanding the number of private lenders who can approve SBA funding. So it's a he. It was a bit back and forth. So to protect small businesses from inappropriate loans and the 7A program from significant loan losses. Yes. So um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, um, the uh, uh, criteria for underwriting and collateral um, for loans under 500,000 has been used. Yeah, good question. Historically since 2004 and before Third that. Of PP. What questions um, so would you ask? Look at Patrick Kelly, and loss rate if you were here today uh, at the hearing, what question would you want to ask? Five out of 10, in some cases, six out of 10 loans each fiscal year from 2004 to 2023 were originated with that criteria. So we have uh, performed subsidy calculations uh, and managed to zero subsidy in nearly all of those years, um, with the exceptions of the Great Recession um, and a few exceptions during the Trump administration, uh, to zero subsidy. So we don't have to guess whether or not that criteria works or what its impact will be, because we can look at the last 23 years of its performance. But I appreciate that. But at the same time, as it's removing standard underwriting requirements, the SBA is lifting the SBLC moratorium. And I think that you know, potentially that's opening the program to non-federally regulated lenders through the SBLC rule. So do you think the combination of these two rules could create a loan evaluation environment where federally regulated lenders that have stricter requirements will be forced to compete with non-federally regulated lenders not subject to the same underwriting requirements? No, um, because the 2004 SBA Express pilot program was created with advisory under the Bush administration with banks for banks. And it is the banks that have historically used that. So the top 25 depository institutions have credit scored loans in the SBA Express program, the Community sure. Express program, the Patriot Express program for years. Credit scoring is used by every uh, bank on the consumer side, and it is used to a varying degree depending on loan size in the commercial. I think some of the lawmakers here, by the way, it's hard to tell if there's special interest involved. So there's certainly a protectionist uh, mindset to some folks where they don't want to allow more banks to have and more lenders rather fintech companies to have access to give out loans because that'll take away funding and money that other banks can be getting like i mentioned 20 minutes ago uh you know there's about 10 or 20 7a lenders that do the majority of 7a loans they're making a ton of money by helping distribute those loans so it's hard to know if some lawmakers want to protect those special interests or not. Eligibility and underwriting criteria, these are changes they've asked. The National Association of Development uh, Corporations, which represents the 504 CDCs, of which there are over 200 in, in the country, have been working on eligibility issues since 2011 in the Obama administration, where they called for the elimination of the personal resource test, as well as the affiliation rule change that we've made final. So these are things that have long been understood as necessary to remove red tape and bureaucracy to get small dollars out the loan. It impacts not just the size of loan, but it impacts every gap in the marketplace. So for example, in rural America, there is a dearth of construction financing. There is a dearth of loans to uh, businesses with no collateral. All of these issues um, are reasons why this program exists and, and, and why lenders are looking to make the the core product more cost effective. Well, I, I appreciate that. And obviously, you know, for our small businesses, want to have less red tape and bureaucracy that we can have access to capital in our small businesses. Correct. But this is still a piecemeal approach of regulatory and procedural changes, often that don't have enough guardrails in them. Um, they're often coming at the last minute. Do you think that the SBA is risking confusing lenders and borrowers about the actual rules by which they're expected to comply? No, because the rules that are reflected in those procedural notices exist today. And what is piecemeal is their application. What has made the agency, so it, what has made lending for SBA hard is you have to hire a nerd like me to figure out all of the different variations within the SOP. What this administrator has done is said, you don't have to hire a nerd like Patrick Kelly. You can harmonize the rules to optimize the outcome. Thank you, I now recognize Mr. Muser from the great state of Pennsylvania for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There we go. Well, he's getting a lot of good questions. Um, so, I, and you know, part of this is the process, right? You have to ask tough questions and see if he knows his stuff and has good answers. Um, he's well informed, it seems like. And yeah, to his point, it's not a piecemeal approach. They're basically trying to solve a problem. They've they've spent months probably working on this, if not longer. Um, so, this is just the nature of it. I, I take back my time. Approval. No, sir. Repeatedly I said today, 100% the SBA, of the employees. You know something? You might do what you want no, in, your, in your bureau. We have oversight here, and you're going to follow the rules of this committee. The SBA uh, has the 7A rules have caused great concern among both Republicans and Democrats. Mostly everyone I speak to feels that you are hell-bent on rushing these rules uh, without any concern for Democrats and Republicans ignoring the final rule. Why is that? I was right. It's not the case. It, we believe it is based upon the, the facts of the situation and the fact that you're just blowing off any recommendation or question. I don't know who this guy is. Anyone know? But you, you just state that's not the case and that's that. Would you like me to elaborate? Well, by moving the program, the 7A portfolio, towards a more subjective underwriting, method for loans under $500,000. How does that protect taxpayers from losses? The OIG has concerns, and you've actually used language, maybe not you, to do what they do for loans under $500,000, which is 75% of all the 7A loans. How does that instill confidence in us? The standard that you're speaking to, consistent with similarly sized non-SBA loans, and the euphemism that was explained at a bank trade association conference, do what you do, is uh, has been around for over two decades and is reflected in every budget that has been passed since then with respect to the subsidy calculation. So lenders came, banks, credit unions came to the SBA and said back in the 2000s under the Bush administration, there is too much red tape associated with small dollar loans. Loans at that time under 350,000 and then this uh, body raised the threshold for express from 350,000 to 500,000. That standard has been in existence. The lenders know this. I understand that they are upset about three additional non-depository uh, uh, institutions potentially becoming SBA, SBLCs, and they have equated that with FinTech, and that's why we are discussing the concerns, which yeah. are legitimate. Safety and soundness is terribly important. I have been a part of the agency's creation of the Office of Credit Risk Management since 2010. I was involved with the regs that were put forward to create the Paris framework, the, the SMART framework. On April 20th, we sent you a letter. Chairwoman, Chairman Williams, Vice Chair Luca Meyer, Chairwoman Van Dyne, myself, uh, uh, about the ability for the SBA to, to, to handle this, these new responsibilities. Uh, and the, uh, we don't have instant replay, but this guy just went off a few minutes ago. We'll, we'll get the clip later. I mean, he went, he went berserk. Let, let's listen in in case he goes off the rails again. Can we expect a response sometime in the future? Yes, you can expect a response. Okay. Anytime. Can you tell me when? Yeah. Uh, in short order, if the process goes through an agency clearance process. Okay. Uh, April 12th, press release, the SBA stated that these new rules will utilize modern technology to make lender oversight and borrower protection stronger. Can you tell us what the technology is uh, uh, to make borrower protection stronger? Yes. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, way so the way that Bank Secrecy Act laws are complied with today is the use of third-party databases where you take a unique identifier from each applicant. So in our case, we're dealing with 10 tax ID number for business applicant, and then owners of 20% or more, or in, in banking vernacular, beneficial owners. We run that against databases to create alerts and flags across 19 different screening ca categories, which traverse eligibility. I mentioned the eligibility criteria earlier, and also uh, uh, run them against lists like OFAC and, and other fraud issues. So for the first time in the agency's history, and, and what is highlighted in the IG's report, is that delegated lenders have historically not had anything pre-approved prior to obtaining E-Train authorization. So under this administrator, we are instituting this not just in our CARES Act programs, but in the uh, uh, general business loan programs, including 7A and 504. When I was Revenue Secretary in Pennsylvania, we implemented something similar. Do you know how much it costs 
and is it ready and when will it be ready to be implemented? Yes, the, the, the great aspect of this uh, from a cost perspective, and this is something we should all celebrate, is that the oversight fees uh, beginning in 2017 can be charged to all of the lenders and are on a pro rata basis. And um, we are able to use uh, other contract vehicles based on a performance base uh, to institute the technology. Thank you. So it is ready Time to is up. implement. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I recognize Ms. Chu from the great state of California for five minutes. Anyone know who that rep representative was on that last one? Again, we'll, we'll get the replay clip, but, uh, you know, he just uh, yelled at uh, Patrick Kelly there. Community of Monterey Park, California, in the aftermath of the tragic mass shooting in January that took the lives of 11 people. Uh, the eligibility for these disaster loans will... And we're going to listen to a few more in case there's any more good questions or outbursts that happen. And um, just to summarize here, you know, this is about expanding lending to small businesses. The concerns that have been brought up so far are about, you know, the fraud prevention are, you know, have they done their diligence on the rules? Think, are they competent enough? Things like that. Basically, have they thought through these rule changes? Some, some pretty good questions, uh, but these rule changes are going into effect within the week. Again, so there'll be more access to SBA funding. Of the loans in underserved markets, as in the current Community Advantage Program. I also want to thank you for clarifying in the notice what loan loss reserve requirements these lenders will face and for modeling these requirements after legislation that I introduced last Congress. These loan loss reserve requirements will ensure that these small nonprofit lenders who've been making community advantage loans for more than five years will have greater flexibility and more capital to do even more lending. However, the May 1st notice does not address the capital requirements and oversight fees that the new com Community Advantage SBLCs can expect. The current Community Advantage pilot program lenders do not have capital requirements, which is important because these are small nonprofit lenders with far less cash on hand than larger financial institutions like banks. Regular SBLCs currently have a capital requir requirement of $5 million, which would be extremely prohibitive if applied to these mission lenders. Additionally, the regular SBLCs face much higher oversight fees than current CA pilot program lenders and would again be cost prohibitive if applied to the new community advantage SBLCs. The lack of clarity on these questions is especially concerning because the final rule goes into effect on Friday. We've heard that on um, that in standard operating procedure um, is forthcoming and we'll cover these details, but can you confirm that the upcoming SLP will clarify that the oversight fees and capitalization requirements within the Community Advantage SBLC program are to remain unchanged from what Community Advantage pilot program lenders currently face. Yes, and uh, with respect to capital requirements, um, the, these, as you mentioned, there's a capital requirement threshold for for-profit <laughs> SBLCs. The capital requirement for the Community Advantage pilot program had historically been applied not at, on a balance sheet, but on a per loan basis because of the issues that you highlight for the nonprofit lenders. It had historically been 10%. Based on your bill and, and uh, uh, Chairman Cardin's uh, bill uh, and the working with the community, the threshold has been established at 5% with a sliding scale for tra trailing portfolio performance that's good over 36% to come, uh, over 36 months to come down. So there, there is no ambiguity. Um, the capital requirement has always been applied through the loan loss reserve on the individual loan in the community advantage program. That's what the procedural notice lays out. For the entire pilot program, community advantage lenders, like all lenders, SBLC, credit unions, banks, CDCs, all lenders, are subject to oversight, and, they're, they, and oversight is charged on a pro rata basis. So the reason that the, the community advantage lenders do not pay as much oversight as, for example, Live Oak Bank would have paid is because in 13 years or 12 years, they've together all 100 plus entities have originated 7,000 loans or a billion dollars. Whereas, for example, Live Oak. It's getting a bit technical now, but um, we'll listen back in uh, as he explains this. But just to say, some of you talked about EIDL grants and you're still wanting your remaining balance. You know, 
we be sure to enter our grants, skipgrants.com. We have a couple thousand dollar grants this month and a whole bunch of other grants as well. Uh, back to our programming. It's by a single voice, but but I, I can assure you they have always been charged a pro rata basis and will continue. And that is true for all lenders. And then the high fees. There is a question of uh, the uh, other SBLC uh, lenders having high fees and then the community advantage program uh, lenders can't hardly afford that. So I'm, I'm not sure what that reference is, but let me see if I can just clarify. So uh, fees for uh, charge to borrowers are universally applied across all lenders and interest rates are capped and universal to all lenders. So that was true. What historically was true in Community Advantage Time Pilot. Sorry. Time is up. Okay. Uh, next, I now recognize Mr. Stauber from uh, Minnesota for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. We'll listen to Mr. Stauber, see if there's good questions and maybe one more, maybe not. I think we've we've learned a lot. I, I'm not sure if the hearing goes to the top of the hour or might extend a little after. But let, let's listen in and um, see. And what do you all think about Patrick Kelly's testimonies so far? And to broadly speaking, the idea behind expanding a 7A businesses across the nation. Like many of my colleagues here today, uh, however, I am troubled by the rules that were finalized last month by the Biden administration addressing the 7A program. While I support allowing flexibility for our small businesses and lending institutions, we must ensure necessary guardrails are in place to protect this program. I've heard from 7A lenders and businesses in my district, including community banks and local credit unions that are worried that these rules will jeopardize the future of the 7A program. <clears throat> Mr. Kelly, annually, about how many investigations or reviews did the SBA conduct into high-risk lenders? Um, I think it's in the order of magnitude, depending on the fiscal year, 300, 400. Okay. Um, the SBA's inspector general reported that the SBA failed to conduct 108 of the 358 planned reviews of high-risk lenders in the fiscal year 2020. That's a third of the high-risk lenders that the SBA missed. Under the new rules, the SBA will be lifting the moratorium on new licenses at grants for small business lending companies. With the lifting of this moratorium, what do you estimate will be the increase in new loan activity? Um, Good so question. I do want to clarify something that's been mentioned regarding the IG report. What the IG report speaks to is that there's levels of supervisory review, yeah. on-site, off-site. And so what it references is that those, it does not, those reviews were conducted. They were just conducted at a, a, a different level of uh, review in terms of procedure. So I just want to clarify that. Second thing that um, uh, I want to speak to with respect to the estimate. So uh, the estimate was included in the proposed rule and, and the final rule. And so at cruise altitude, typical SBLCs uh, contribute about 450 loans uh, per, fris per fiscal year. For example, we have three SBLCs today that are in the top 10 of SBA lending. And as I've mentioned, these licenses have changed hands over the last 40 years, 61 times. And the agency has been responsible for approving who becomes an SBLC. So we review their safety and soundness, their portfolio performance. So by the way, that's a great parallel of you know the protectionist. So imagine Uber and taxi medallions, the taxi lobby was like, no, don't issue any more licenses, especially in New York, a similar idea to allowing more lenders, incumbents are gonna want to not allow that to protect the current interests. So that this is the back and forth here. Do you believe the Small Business Administration has the capacity, expertise, or bandwidth to be the sole regulator of any financial institution? Yes, and what I'd like to clarify on that point, because it's important, the use case for what we oversee is loan assets. Yeah. And it's a simpler use case to stand in than it is for OCC or FDIC. Because for example, with FDIC or OCC, they have first order problems that they need to address. Let's say the loan portfolio, commercial real estate is underperforming. They have second order concerns, which is the depositors. So if a bank goes under, are we gonna honor deposits? Then they have third order, which is the impact of that in the local marketplace. We have shown throughout the SBA's history that if a lender comes and goes and dissolves, we can transfer the book of assets to another SBA lender. 
and it does not create the disruption or the need for intervention on the part of the federal government. So those loan portfolios can be transferred. They're conforming assets, which means they're easy to underwrite from a diligence perspective. We have a rank order of the quality of the credit <coughs> profile on a quarterly basis. And as a result, a willing buyer will take that asset portfolio. So if we decide that someone is not participating in lending as we do on a quarterly basis through the Loan Oversight Committee, we can remove their delegated authority. Okay. The uh, director of Okram can suspend them at her. In By the way, let's everyone hit the like button now we'll, before we uh, we'll, we'll go for about five, 10 more minutes. Uh, let's try to get to over 100 live viewers here. Uh, this has been a really fascinating testimony, in my opinion, I, I, hopefully for you as well. A ton of uh, strong questions, not only about 7A, but EIDL, PPP, EIDL grants didn't come up yet, but in the comments, it's coming up, of course. It roll over an expanded 7A program, let alone act as a chief regulator of any financial institution. Secondly, I'm deeply concerned that local community banks and credit unions in northern Minnesota will have more oversight, scrutiny, and regulation put on them than the Silicon Valley fintech startups. We must protect the 7A program, and I yield back. So, Mr. Chairman, before Mr. Starber leaves, I think we should wish him a happy birthday. Ha. Well, I don't know if he wants us to or not. <laughs> Chairman, I second that. <laughs> I withdraw my motion. Yeah. <laughs> I'm celebrating my 39th uh, birthday 18 times, Dean. Ha. 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 Okay, uh, I now recognize Ms. Davids from Kansas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. For All right, let's listen to Ms. Davis and see what she has to say, and then uh, go, and then I'll do a quick recap of everything we've heard over the past hour. Uh, we've had about seven or eight people ask questions so far. Flex how imperative our role in oversight is uh, as it relates to uh, protecting our small businesses, and um, and then of course, as Mr. Stauber said, the integrity of the Seven A program. Um, I want to jump right into uh, a follow up actually to uh, some of the questions that Mr. Stauber was asking, which is um, around the regulation of uh, the lenders. Can you like share a bit about uh, where you believe the SBA's statutory authority uh, comes Ooh. from uh, to examine the uh, what would normally be the core requirements of a lending institution or de depository institution that has the, the variety of assets that you were describing earlier, uh, whether it's uh, capital requirements, liquidity, risk management. Uh, can you share where uh, you believe the statutory authority comes from for SBA to be able to do that? Yes. Uh, under the Trump administration, there was a law passed um, uh, with the Republican Congress uh, uh, outlining and detailing uh, the role and responsibility of the Office of Credit Risk Management located in the Office of Capital Access to do all of those things, which has historically been understood to be authorized under our administration of the program from the Small Business Act, Section 7A, which requires that we determine reasonable reassurance of repayment and eligibility for the program. So in order to determine reasonable reassurance of repayment, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that your reasonable reassurance of repayment is not the same thing as uh, ensuring that you have the ability to fully examine the allocation of assets, liquidity requirements, and risk management overall of an entire entity in the same way that uh, depository institutions are. So if you're talking about asset allocation, like long-term dated treasuries uh, with respect to deposits, agreed, and that's not what we do. If you're talking about assets generated in our program and their ability to be repaid to the taxpayer without the guarantee being honored, then we do have the authority. Okay, so I want to, um, I also want to follow up on some of the questions that Mr. McGarvey was asking because uh, I- McGarvey, Cindy, you're right. Thanks for that. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I think that you were responding to his question about lenders by talking about the borrowers um, and the need to reduce red tape, um, both on the borrower side and on the lender side. Could you expand a bit on uh, what you mean when you talk about the reduction of red tape because the request for less red tape from lenders uh, isn't the same thing as opening up the program for additional lenders that are not being regulated 
um, or overseen in the same way that depository institutions are. And I just want to make sure that I'm fully understanding your response. And real quick, because I have a feeling you'll use the rest of the time, when it turns red, if you could just stop and make sure that uh, it wouldn't be more appropriate to follow up with a written response to the question, uh, you might find that the rest of the hearing. Well, will her questions are quite long winded here. Agreed. And I want to apologize to Mr. Muser for, for my Irish coming up. Uh, and I understand that uh, we will be able to answer questions as we normally do. So um, I am passionate about defending civil servants and the role that they've played in the pandemic. So I apologize. Um, so um, with respect to your question about lenders, so what I'm describing, um, and this is, I guess, important, and I, I, I hope to leave you all here, uh, you know, where we're in agreement, is that for time and memorial, um, the subsidy calculation has incorporated the underwriting and collateral criteria. And all that we have done is harmonize across a standard 7A small loan with an SBA express term loan that standard that more lenders have used historically every fiscal year. And so if the object of the exercise is to engage, for example, the 4,500 community banks more meaningfully. So it's been reported that 83% of those same 4,500 community we'll banks- We'll make these the final remarks. I think he's got a good point here. Let's listen in for a few more seconds. Years ...prior to 2020 Paycheck Protection Program. So if we want them to meaningfully be available in their communities, we need to optimize the stop. responsibilities, the, the criteria that they need. Can I stop you there? Um, I, I absolutely recognize that. I just will add that uh, some of the fintechs that we've been talking about are not subject to all of the rules and regulations and oversight that our community banks have been adhering to for a very long time. With that, I will yield back. I now recognize Mr. Elsey hey. from the great state of Texas for five minutes well there we go um really fascinating um this might go for another half an hour but you know we'll we'll give some of the notes we'll have a summary of this on the blog i'll clip the outburst from earlier from uh mr mcgarvey uh actually we we didn't hear what preceded mr mcgarvey getting so worked up and yelling at patrick kelly so um, apologies we missed that part because i was talking over it but whatever it was i'm not sure it warranted yelling at uh, Mr. Kelly. But um, I think in short, th these lawmakers are obviously doing their job by becoming um, or rather uh, playing playing the investigator and asking lots of questions, no matter how big or small. So, you know, I think overall, the, these SBA changes will be good, both for borrowers, for all of you, for business owners, there'll be more options. Uh, and both and for lenders as well. Obviously, incumbent lenders may not like it because some of their business may be taken away or distributed. But I, I think, and I want to pull out this last stat bef before we leave today. Last year, 32,000 SBA 7A loans were approved. So not that many. That's for $15 billion, an average loan size of just under half a million dollars. So you know, this is still a relatively small number and we're talking about maybe we expand it by in, in the thousands more per year. Anyway, really appreciate seeing so many of you uh, as always. And if there's a few links in the description, if you want to apply for 7A, if you want to hear more, go check those out. Stay tuned for a recap. We've got a few more lives coming up this week. And until then, I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone.